um, you would please sign in if you haven't had an opportunity to do so. Um, and we will get started in just a minute. For everyone online, I just want to make you aware that this is being recorded. So um, we will be uh, interspersing comments from in-person and online. So anyone and everyone that has an interest in participating and sharing their thoughts today will have the opportunity to do so. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started in just one minute. I'm just going to let a few more people sign in and take their seats. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Christina Byrne, and I'm the Department Manager of Public Outreach at OCTA. And we'll be doing a round of self-introductions in just a moment with um, those of us that are at the front here, so you'll all be aware of who's with you today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And if you haven't had a chance, please sign in. Please note that today is being recorded for documentation purposes, so we can take notes of all the comments that we receive. Um, and you know, we encourage you to continue to, to participate in this process going forward. If you haven't had the opportunity to sign up on our database on our website, anyone that signs in today, of course, will be added. So all um, future updates will be, will be given to you as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my right to Rob to introduce yourself. Good morning. I'm Rob Plotsky with HDR Engineering, and I'm the Consultant Project Manager. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Fu with the Owens County Transportation Authority. I'm part of the Planning Division. Good morning. My name is George Roska. I'm also with uh, HDR, the Deputy Project Manager. Good morning. I'm Jason Lee, OCTA and Catholic Programs. Thank you. And we will be having comments um, in the chat as well that I'll be monitoring. Um, throughout the throughout the presentation today, and we'll be calling on people um, virtually as well as in person. So with that, um, next slide, please. Oh. All right, we've covered this as well. Please use your raise your hand function if you're joining us virtually, and we'll be monitoring um, that as well as the chat function. And now I'd like to go through the agenda and I'll be turning over the presentation to um, Dan Fu. All right, good morning again, everyone. Dan Fu from OCTA. So I have a presentation that I'll go over relatively quickly to set the context. And then we wanna hear the comments from you all here in the audience as well as online. So next slide, please. So let me just kind of take a moment. And first off, can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. I'm, I'm not a loud speaker, so I want to make sure everyone uh, hears me. So I just want to take a moment and talk about the context in terms of OCTA's complex relationship with the railroad. So as, an, as a county transportation agency, OCTA owns roughly 40 miles of the railroad corridor within Orange County, where we have multiple roles and functions. We also serve as the managing director for the Los Angeles Rail Corridor, which is a 351 mile rail corridor from San Diego all the way up to San Luis Obispo. And then at the same time, OCTA is also a joint powers authority member of the Southern California Re Regional Railroad Authority or Metrolink. So that's kind of our role and function. And then in terms of the operator, this is where the complexity comes in. While OCT is the underlining owner of the railroad in Orange County, we're not the railroad operator of record. The railroad operator of record um, are really uh, either Metrolink, Amtrak as a tenant, uh, that's a state uh, commuter rail system, as well as the freight operators, whether it's Union Pacific, further north in within the county or uh, BNSF railway within uh, Southern Orange County. So that's where the complexity comes in and where we have to work with the operator, even though we're the underlying owner. 
And then in terms of what's germane to the, today's discussion is about seven miles of the railroad in Orange County. So seven out of the 40 one or so miles reside basically along the coast in South Orange County, and much of it is actually 200 feet or less next to the ocean. So next slide, please. So this particular slide is pretty telling. The railroad has been in operation, th this particular line has been in operation since the late 1800s. You can see on the top line, 1888 through about let's say um, in the in the second line 2021 130 years give or take there had been three major events leading to closures on the railroad so 130 years single handful of closure events but when you look at 2021 and forward there have been at least five closures and i think many of you are uh, very much aware of what's going on and so that tells us something is happening by way of um, that's leading to these closures. Many of the instances were as a result of landslides that had led to the uh, extended closure. So next slide, please. So this particular slide is uh, really just showing the changing conditions over the last 50 years. So on the upper line, if you see 1972, with the um, basically a, showing a pretty wide beach. And even in on the upper right-hand corner in 2013, it's still a pretty wide beach. But some weather event happened, I think it was around 2014 or 15, that led to basically the beach receding over, uh, over the last decade. And in 2017, you can see that it's narrow and then leading to 2021, where OCTA and Metrolink and others experienced um, landslides. And, and so as a result, had to take on some emergency projects. So next slide, please. So I think um, many of you have also seen this particular slide. This is a slide that we actually took from UCI, um, their research. And on the upper the, the upper portion of the slide, um, let me back up. So basically this is looking at the literal cell from San Pedro all the way down to Oceanside. So on the upper slide, upper portion of the slide, that's called the San Pedro cell. And what the uh, UCI researchers, um, Dr. Sanders and company in particular, had done was looked at a 20 year period, I believe is from early 2000s, um, uh, 2000 to 2021. So basically a two decade period and um, looked at the, the beach width. And so, and, and looked at how much naturally the beach comes and goes based on the season and so forth. So they had looked at basically a two, two decade worth of data and in the San Pedro cell, when you look at kind of the entire cell as a whole, there was more or less a takeaway of a net gain in terms of the beach width. But when you're looking at the, the, the bottom portion, which is called the ocean size cell, you see a lot of red, which basically shows that the beach had, there's been a net loss over that two decade period. So scientifically, that's telling us something is happening in terms of, at the end of the day, uh, the beach is receding. And um, in terms of understanding truly why, I think everyone is still trying to figure that out. But factually, the, um, the data shows that at least in the ocean size cell, um, it's really a net loss in terms of the beach width over the last two decades. So next slide, please. So in terms of local resiliency activities, um, I, I think many of you are familiar with the four um, items that are on top, starting with the Cypress Shore um, initial track stabilization, as well as the track stabilization, and then the, the various projects that have been undertaken uh, here in San Clemente as a result of the various landslides, like the Casa Romantica, and then most recently in January of this year with the Mariposa Point or the Mariposa Pedestrian Bridge. Um, what we've also been working closely with the city of San Clemente on um, are monitoring their efforts. So the last couple of items are efforts that the city of San Clemente had led. And uh, the second to the last one is the city working with the Army Corps of Engineers over the last couple of decades on a sand replenishment project by the pier. And then the very last one is their uh, nature-based resiliency uh, plan that they launched back in late September of last year, and there was a public meeting um, in, in February of this year. So next slide, please. So all of that issues that, that we've talked about really led to OCTA as 
one of the property owners, we're not the only property owner that's in within the city. Um, we're one of many property owners, whether it's the state, state parks, the city, many private property owners and so forth, that led OCTA to needing to take a careful look at the railroad that goes through the city and, and many other cities throughout the county. So in terms of kind of parsing this out into two pieces, there's a lot of discussions about coastal retreat. And I, I think many of you, again, are very much aware of what SANDAG is doing to the south of us with respect to their stabilization projects as well as their, their Del Mar um, realignment uh, project. And that particular, in that particular instance, they had started that process, I believe back in 2017 or thereabout with respect to the realignment project. We're, we're a little bit behind in terms of the starting point, but um, we, we are constantly talking to Del Mar. And in fact, I'm going to a meeting tomorrow that Del Mar is leading on their literal sale to better educate ourselves in terms of the science and, and working closely with our neighbors to, to the south. So that's really more of the long-term coastal retreat strategies. It's gonna take realistically decades for that to come to fruition. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do something about that. So there are um, there there are discussions in the works in terms of who is going to be leading that long term effort in terms of potentially looking at coastal retreat strategies, but there's the here and now in terms of we need to keep the railroad operational and we talked about this a moment ago, five closures within a three year period as recent as January of this year and we're still um, getting out of that situation, even though there's, it's looking very much in, in a positive direction as far, as far as resumption of service. But when you look at the closures, many of them last for many, many months. It's not a matter of a week or so. So even with this late, latest one, it occurred in late January, and it's likely at the, uh, on the trajectory that we're uh, on right now that will likely resume service sometime in, in the latter part of this month. So that's lasting for months. And in other instances, the same, the same situation. So having said that, we're looking, we're undertaking what we call a coastal rail resiliency study. It's a 24 month effort. We just started this 24 month effort during the latter part of 2023. And so, um, I think there's been a lot of confusions about concepts we've come up with that it's the end all be all, but I wanna make sure that everybody's clear. We're still in the infancy of the study phase. We're having, and Christina is gonna to touch on that today. We're having a lot of stakeholder meetings and public outreach meetings. We're really in the midst of it. We're not gonna complete that process until the latter part of May. So with respect to this short and midterm study, it's really to look at short term solutions that will last us up, upwards of, say, a decade. So it's not a hard and fast. It's really just kind of a target in terms of those solutions. And then medium-term solutions that may last for upwards of several decades, while other things are in the background in terms of being worked on, uh, as far as, for, for instance, the, the long-term strategies. And then we also want to gain an understanding of all that's happening, and that's kind of what I alluded on earlier by us being involved with what Sand, Sandag is doing, what the County of Orange is doing, what San Clemente and University of California, Irvine, and so on and so forth. So from that standpoint, we're trying to better educate ourselves in terms of understanding the science of what's going on with respect to the uh, beach erosion and the landslides. And then as part of this process, we're going to come up with solutions that we're going to be vetting with the stakeholders. So that's that's really part of um, this two-year effort. Again, we're just starting out. We started this effort during the latter part of 2023. And so we're really in the first quarter of 24. We're still kind of in the infancy of the study phase. Next slide, please. So this is the study milestone and, and there are really, in, in a way, seven distinct phases of the study. As I alluded to, we're really more in, in kind of straddling between phase one and phase two. We're, we're really um, in phase two. And uh, as we go through this process, and Christina, again, is going to touch on this, there are going to be touch points with the stakeholders once we have something tangible that we can share with the stakeholders in terms of the short and the midterm solutions. So next slide, please. 
So this is where there's been a lot of confusion. So I, I think I want to spend a minute and touch on this uh, particular area or topic here. <clears throat> so the study itself is a two-year study. It's really looking at short and midterm, but really it's in three distinct sort of phases, if you will. We're looking at it from the lens of immediate needs in terms of getting ahead of things, getting ahead of all the emergencies we've had over the last handful of years. We talked about what those are. So the, the idea is to try to get ahead of things and identify really very immediate solutions that we can look at in terms of making sure that the railroad is operational. And then the phase two would be the short-term solutions that we have yet to, to come up with any of the solutions yet. And then the same can be said about the midterm. So that's really been uh, the point of confusion in terms of the study and how it's parsed down into three distinct phases. So with that, um, next slide, please. So with this initial assessment, it's really looking, again, the emphasis is looking from the lens of the railroad operator, how can we keep the railroad operational while we're doing other things in terms of looking at short-term solutions and medium-term solutions. And that's what the engineering team had come up with in terms of identifying. I think the key is they did an assessment of the seven mile stretch, which is effectively from the county line all the way up to approximately um, southern part of San Juan Capistrano, northern part of city of Dana Point, and really identify areas that are vulnerable to another, and, and I'll use this, <clears throat> excuse me, as an example, the Mariposa, landslide that we've recently experienced. So that's really the emphasis of this initial assessment is to find other, identify other locations that are gonna be um, a threat in terms of the next season, we're gonna have another rainstorm and then there's gonna be another shutdown as a result of whether it's a landslide or a beach erosion on the seaward side. So next slide, please. So in terms of the identification, the team came up with seven areas that we ought to keep an eye on. So that's really monitoring, keeping an eye on it and making sure that it's not worsening in the next months and however many months. And so there, there are various locations from milepost 200 all the way to 207.25. And you can see under item four, Mariposa pedestrian bridge was even identified as an area that we should keep an eye on. And obviously we, we know, you know, what's happened since late January. And then next are the four areas that, that we really need to do something about out there, or we're going to experience another closure. And I, and I want to kind of hone in on just as an example, um, number three, which is 204 to about 204 and a half mile post. That's already set in motion. So this particular mini assessment was conducted between November of last year through about January of this year. And in fact, it's not, I don't believe it's on the slide today, but, um, oh, actually it is on the upcoming slide and I'll touch on that in a moment. But between January, between November and January of this year, the Mariposa Bridge was still intact. And then following the assessment, all of that set in motion and two spans of the bridge have already been removed as, as a result of the landslide. So next slide, please. So this is potential reinforcement area number one. So the other emphasis I wanna make is these four areas were looked at from a standpoint of really at a planning level. There are concepts that we came up with. That doesn't mean that that's ultimately the, the final solutions. It's because that's all part of the planning process. We're vetting it, and then eventually we'll need to further engineer these concepts to, to make sure that they are, in fact, going to work. But I think the other um, major limiting factor is time that we don't have. These are areas that are likely going to fail before the next major rainstorm event. And so the idea is to try to get something done on the ground before we suffer another Mariposa Point shutdown, just like we had in January of this year and the years preceding um, this year with whether it's Casa Romantica or Cypress Shore. Um, so that's really the key with these reinforcement areas. And then uh, next slide, please. 
So this is the second area that we're looking at. Again, for the common denominator in terms of these four areas are, I kind of see them in, in kind of three different ways. Areas one and two really lack a beach. So as a result of beach erosion, the last really line of defense is the railroad and there's nothing buffering mother nature and the railroad. And so the uh, these these two areas really are uh, due to the lack of beach or beach erosion. Next slide, please. And so this is the photo that I was alluding to earlier. So between November of last year and January of this year, you can see that the Mariposa pedestrian bridge was still intact. And then in the latter part of January, all of that was set in motion. So that tells us in terms of the reality of how much of a threat these areas are in terms of leading to a, a railroad closure. So in terms of the, the temporary solution, we're looking at uh, for at least the, the, the segment that's adjacent or yes, adjacent to the two spans of the bridge, we're looking at a temporary catchment wall, which is similar to what was done in the Casa Romantica area from a couple years ago to effectively block the debris from further coming down because we're finding that the earth is still actually not very stable, even though we've, we haven't had a lot of rain in recent time. So that is something that is really more on a temporary basis. And that work, as I understand, is being wrapped up and, and we're hoping to resume rail service during the latter part of this month. Next slide, please. So this last potential reinforcement area is a little bit different in terms of the beach. There is a beach there, but there is not much of a um, protection for the railroad. So the idea in terms of the concept is to look at an engineer engineer revetment, and that's a little bit more uh, stable than your typical rock, uh, uh, rock placement or riprap placement that's uh, common to areas one and two. And so that's the potential solution here. And so basically these are the four areas that we have ident identified as being imminent threat to the continued operation of the railroad. And in fact, number three has already set in motion. So that underscores the importance of needing to get something done sooner rather than later. But again, I wanna emphasize that these are really immediate needs. We have not come up with the short-term solutions yet. We have not come up with the midterm solutions. So that does not mean by, by way of OCTA and Metrolink and others implementing these solutions it necessarily precludes any of the future activities. So next slide, please. So in terms of next steps, we are continuing to engage stakeholders. Uh, we started this process in late January, and I believe we're gonna end this process sometimes during, uh, sometime during the latter part of May of this year. And depending on the nature of what happens, we need to make sure we set up uh, the procedure in place in the event of another emergency. It's not so much if, it's really when another emergency is going to occur. And then making sure that all of the agencies are aware of what's going on. So obviously there is the regulatory permitting process and that's something that we have been engaged with the Coast Lands Commission and City of San Clemente, County of Orange, and on and on in terms of all of the folks who are who have a stake in this and, and of course, the public at large. So that is something that we're looking at in terms of making sure that we try to get ahead of things and not have a situation where we've had um, numerous times over the last handful of years. So with that, I'll hand it off to Christina to talk about the public outreach process. Thank you, Dan. Again, Christina Byrne, and I am the Public Outreach Department Manager at the Orange County Transportation Authority. Thank you again for joining us today. As Dan said, this is a two-year study, and there will be um, touch points throughout for the public to interact with the study and actually provide feedback. Um, in addition to the listening sessions that you're a part of today that are continuing um, February of this year through the latter part of May, as Dan indicated, also, there will be time for us to have um, dialogue with the public during the initial concept development, which we um, anticipate being in the fall of this year, as well as refinement of the concepts in spring of 2025. 
um, the draft feasibility study report release, as well as the final feasibility study report when that's released, we anticipate in the fall of 2025. So in, again, in addition to the listening sessions, there will be outreach um, milestones during the draft concept outreach, as well as the draft plan development. And the goal of these listening sessions are really to gather feedback from the community and document that feedback um, and to make sure that we continue to share the expectation to maintain in place the existing coastal rail line and minimize passenger and freight service disruptions to the extent possible for up to 30 years, assess the vulnerabilities and issues of concern and identify potential opportunities for us to continue to enhance collaboration with various agencies and the community. And then again, document that feedback. So with that, we're going to um, move into the listening session portion of the day. Um, before I do that, though, I just wanted to remind everyone that we are continuing these listening sessions through the end of May. After today, we will have a residential group online listening session on a virtual listening session on April 3rd. Information regarding that will be coming out shortly. And then we have two general public sessions on April 11th, which will be virtual and then in person on May 30th. The May 30th meeting will be held at um, San Clemente City Hall, and we're finalizing the details for that. And then there is an elected officials, officials roundtable um, location to be determined that um, state and federal as well as regional and local elected officials will be um, a part of that roundtable for further discussion. So with that, um, we're going to now open it up for comments. And if you would be so kind as to, um, you know, have your comments be just a few minutes. And if there are others that are um, commenting on similar things, you know, feel free um, to continue to share your thoughts. But if you're commenting on similar things, just perhaps give some time for others to be able to be heard as well. I will be monitoring the chat. Um, and in person, we have microphones around the room as well. So um, I'll be calling on people intermittently between the audience, the table, as well as online. So if there is someone in the audience that would like to speak, I just ask that you raise your hand. Actually, those at the table as well. And we will make sure that we get a microphone to you in a timely manner. So with that, um, we're, we're ready. So if you have any comments, please feel free to raise your, raise your hand. And if you would be so kind as to introduce yourself when the mic comes to you and just give it a minute, um, to make sure that you you say your name, say your organization, and then start speaking, that would be very helpful. So why don't we start with Steve, please? Good morning. Um, Susie Whitelaw with um, uh, Save Our Beaches San Clemente. I have a PhD in marine sedimentology and 30 plus years experience um, with uh, geology and hydrogeology. Um, OCTA says that they are trying to figure it out and they're trying to use the best science. Um, I, I know that I, I do see that you're, you, you sent out your RFP and your work plan to Dr. Brett Sanders at UCI for a, a peer review. And what he said was exactly what I said. He said, I did a word search and I found the word sand once. And this is not good science. You are really not doing a meaningful job of trying to look at sand. You're not doing a meaningful job of trying to figure out why the beach is eroding. I'll, I'll tell you what the pattern is. You can see it on our website. I've taken Dr. Sanders' data. You can see there's a slow, gradual narrowing of our beaches through time, as Mr. Fu showed. Once the beaches reach a very a certain critical narrowness, the storm waves start to interact more robustly with the seawall and the riprap that you already have out. Once that happens, you can see there's a rapid increase in the rate of acceleration, in the acceleration of the erosion, and it goes to nothing. We saw that happen um, in the 2019, 2021 period at Cypress Shores. That beach has still not been able to reestablish itself because of the continued scour in front of it. And if you put this revetment, this revetment, um, we understand you talked to state parks earlier this week and you told them that it would probably extend out of your right of way. So 50 to 60 feet, scaling your diagram, it looks like it's 50 to 60 feet or maybe all the way out to a hundred feet. That's, that's all the beach that we have left at State Beach. There's some areas where there is zero feet 
of dry sand. The maximum dry sand is 50 feet. You, you are going to occupy the entire beach with seawalls. I also believe that you have been relying upon your own staff who are not experts in, in coastal erosion to, to opine that seawalls don't hurt beaches. That is against every coastal engineering um, factual expert witness testimony. Indeed, uh, the first pictures back in 2008, 2013 from Cypress Shores, yes, the seawall was not affecting the beach. The beach was fine because there was 200 feet of sand in front of it. And as long as you have enough sand in front of the seawall, the seawall doesn't hurt the beach. It's great if the, if the, if the seawall was 200 miles inland. It really wouldn't hurt the beach. So the answer is really simple. If you don't want to destroy the beach and have to pay all the environmental mitigation, first put sand out in front of the beach. You say that you are doing just the same as all, you know, sand ag is doing, San Clemente is doing, replenishing the beach. No, they are trying to restore a habitat. What this would do is destroy a habitat. This is not a short-term solution to your problem. This is a long-term destruction of our environment. This is death to our beaches. This is, this is not going to allow, even if you try to replenish it, what's happened down in Cypress Shores, if you look at the profile, um, all our other profiles are fairly gently sloping beaches in front of it, in front of the, the, the riprap pile that you've put at Cypress Shore, it just goes straight down now it's gonna be really hard and really expensive to get that beach back. Even if you did move inland and you took all those rocks with you, $200 million worth of rocks, I don't know where you're gonna put them back into the mountains where you get them. But even then you've, you've destroyed the whole profile of the beach. We have a, a tagline now that boulders kill beaches. Um, Thank you, we, we do understand that you need to protect your tracks. For 120 years, that wide sandy beach protected your tracks. It was only until they got this narrow that you have all of these problems. And even on the on the landward side of the railroads, I see you have uh, understood that liquefaction is potentially occurring here. Um, you take li liquefaction is what happens when you um, are down on the the beach and you play pity pat with the sand, and it all turns liquidy. Um, you take sand, you add water, you put heavy vibration on it like freight trains, you get liquefaction. And I, I'm glad that you're beginning to understand that. So you're you're trying to keep the water away from the landward side of the tracks. You need to keep the water from the ocean from getting under your tracks. And the way you do that is with rocks because the water is going to go straight through those rocks. You do it with a wide sandy beach. All right, so thank you, Susie. We're gonna call in some others. There, we have someone online. Um, Mandy, would you be able to unmute your, or we'll unmute you, and if you could um, say your name and introduce yourself and the agency you represent. Yes, thank you so much. Um, my name is Mandy Sackett. I'm speaking on behalf of the Surfrider Foundation, and I'm the Senior California Policy Coordinator. Um, so at Surfrider, we've reviewed the initial assessment and we appreciate this listening session and the efforts that OCTA is making to get public input. Um, and we do hope that you take everyone's comments today into um, and concerns into at heart. Um, so we're really strongly opposed to the proposed project being processed as a permit exemption. This is a major public works project and OCTA has to apply for a full coastal development permit. The full permit process would allow for the necessary technical and alternative analyses. Um, it would allow for robust public input <clears throat> and it would allow for a thorough consistency review with the California Coastal Act and with the California Public Trust. There's no way a $200 million project can justifiably go through without CEQA review and without Coastal Act review. It's offensive. Um, we were dismayed that the initial assessment did not take a closer look at nature-based options in any substantial way. Cobble and sand could be stockpiled similar to riprap to be ready to address erosion. And um, we think that OCTA should conduct contract and 
independent assessment of nature-based solutions to do a really thorough and alternatives analysis. We have these two years, why not do it right? Um, a few more points here. There's extensive evidence and it's a, that um, OCTA is denying, we're offended that OCTA is denying that riprap at Cypress Shores is not making erosion worse. We strongly suggest that you get a third party independent review of that ASAP. In a recent OC Register article, Dr. Brett Sanders of UC Irvine, Irvine stated that, quote, within the field of coastal engineering, it is firmly established that armoring the coastline to protect inland infrastructure leads to increased erosion directly, immediately in front of the armoring, end quote. So if OCTA does want to move forward with a full armoring plan of San Clemente's beaches, especially with such alternative review of analysis of um, alternatives, that is going to extremely damage the public resources and, um, and be a huge detriment to all of us who live and visit San Clemente and Dana Point's beaches. And um, not to mention that this is directly adjacent to Trestle Surf Break, one of the most popular and iconic surf breaks in all of California. And we don't know yet how this is going to affect the sediment dynamics. How might this affect the surf break? OCTA has not done that analysis and we request it. Um, and finally, just last point here. Um, as the mean tide line migrates landward and seas and erosion worsen in front of seawalls, those seawalls will be on public lands. OCTA needs to start thinking seriously and accepting that extremely robust mitigation package would be necessary and that the scale of this project to mitigate the emergency riprap already placed, it has a massive impact on access, habitat, recreational impacts. So we would like as a part of this project and wrapping it in with the prior emergency riprap, we'd like to see really substantial sand and nature-based mitigation along with Orange, along, uh, all, excuse me, all along South Orange County's beaches in line with Coastal Commission's recommendation for their sand mitigation fee. We generally support the Coastal Commission's use of the real estate valuation method for mitigation. And um, finally, we also just want to see the extension of the coastal trail south along the railroad and a firm commitment to relocating the rail by 2035, similar to Del Mar's commitment. So I know that was a lot. Um, I'm planning on putting on in a quick letter, but um, I just really appreciate your time and consideration of our comments. Thank you, Mandy. I appreciate you joining us today. Um, Jeff, please go ahead. Yeah, Jeff Berg, bring back our beaches. Um, three things. Jeff Berg, bring back our beaches. Um, three things. First of all, the way a couple of slides that you all presented uh, deserve mentioning. First of all, the slide that shows the beach in front of Cypress Shores, 1972 through 2013. I'm not good at math. It's 40 something years of wide. And if you look at 2013, actually widening beaches, right? It's well understood why the sand disappeared. We won't go into that this second, but that ties into, thank you for putting that slide up. The slide that you all presented from Dr. Sanders, I feel like was presented a little disingenuously. Of course, the beaches, in North County are wider than the beaches in South County. They're in the 13th cycle of sand replenishment. They keep sand in the system. That's what we have not been doing in South County. And of course we wanna do. And I think a clarification on the part of OCTA would be helpful. You're talking about two years of listening sessions, but some of us feel like that's a misdirection play while you're gonna to try to pave the six, seven miles of San Clemente with revetment and armoring that have been resulting in the erosion that we're seeing. I brought this up last week at the Dana Point meeting. You all need to leave your offices and you need to come down. I'd be happy to host you. I'm sure some of these other people would be happy to host you. Come down to the San Mateo Creek trestles area and look at the beach that has been replenished naturally all the way to the south end of your riprap. 
I was actually surfing yesterday. And by the way, I have a PhD in surf. I was surfing yesterday in front of Southgate um, in the Cypress Shores area. The beach is trying to rebuild itself. The problem is your riprap and more riprap and more revetment are just going to magnify the issues. You, you all need to clarify what you're trying to do here when you say immediate and emergency. You're trying to slip in all this revetment while, while talking about a two-year listening session that's not going to do us any good if you've paved six miles of San Clemente beaches. So you all need to consider sand as part of uh, any emergency or immediate solution. And I think you'll hear more about that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Go ahead, Tony. Good morning. I'm Tony Nelson with Capital Cares. We've been coastal advocates for about 10 or 12 years now. We're based in Capistrano Beach, and Dana Point is clearly two, two of your watch areas are in Dana Point, but we're very concerned as well with San Clemente to our south, and we see what's happening. Um, I have several comments. Um, the first one is I listened to the OCTA board meeting last week when um, Mr. Fu uh, was first presenting this information, and he talked about the fact that they were trying to avoid surprises. He used the word surprises several times. And I'm curious as to why OCTA is surprised by what's happening here. Uh, somebody sent me a study that was done by Sandeg in 1993 that talked about our littoral cell and talk very clearly with a recommendation that the railroads put down sand to protect their tracks. Okay, that is 30 years ago. And then more recently in 2003, only 20 years ago, there was a law sand report that talked about um, the need for sand and talked about possibly relocating the line. Nothing happened in 20 years. And now here we are in 2024 and you were surprised by what's happened? Uh, we're we're having trouble, you know, at the public level, trusting your agency. You could have avoided this. There was no need for the destruction on our bluffs. There was no need for the destruction of our beaches. And your uh, current study is talking about, Susie mentioned that sand is mentioned only once. Well, riprap, we counted, is mentioned 54 times. You have one solution and it's rock. And I don't know why you're not listening to the experts that we have. Dr. Brett Sanders is an eminent PhD on this subject, and he is telling you the riprap is going to kill our beaches. So um, I want to speak for the public. Um, when you talk about key stakeholders, and you use that term several times in the OCTA meeting, you left out the public. We're not considered key. Well, I'm here to tell you we are key. My kids are key, my grandkids are key, and so are yours. And they will not thank you for destroying our beaches. This is not okay. Long after the railroad has blown up with some kind of derailment, because you know that's going to happen eventually, we will have no beaches because of what you're doing here today. So I'm really speaking for our future generations, for tourism, for the people of San Clemente and Dana Point, the people from from all of Orange County, all of the millions of visitors that come to our beaches. And there are economic stakes as well. Our tourism industry is very, very dependent on having beaches that people can actually get to without walking over rocks and breaking their legs. You know, come on. Uh, the only economics here, as far as I can tell on the railroad, the only economic um, agency, the only agency that actually has an economic interest here is BNSF. It's the only profitable uh, use of your line. Amtrak is subsidized by the taxpayer. Metrolink is subsidized by the taxpayer. Both always have been. They've never been profitable. BNSF is the only one making a profit and not that much. They're only sending a billion dollars of freight up this entire corridor. And that represents 0.04% of all the freight that is moved in California. It's nothing. It's not even a rounding error. So I'd encourage you to back up and really think about what we're doing here. You keep, you're starting with this paradigm that the railroad is essential. And I, I really encourage you to take a look at that, to have the courage to look at it and say, is this really an essential use of our coast? 
you have had months and months over the last two years where we've had no railroad and the world has not come to an end. We have not noticed, you know, huge um, impacts of cars on the, on the five freeway. We have not had, you know, supply chain uh, issues because our freight didn't get there. The freight that's going up this line does not come to Orange County in LA. It's going to Barstow and going all over the country. So please back up. Think about what you're doing here before you destroy our beaches for all our future generations. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is you talk about monitoring movement on the bluffs. So I understand, I guess this is a question for Mr. Klobsky. So you have engineers who put monitors on the bluffs that are trying to give you an advanced warning that, oh, something might be moving. I understand that these are movement monitors. Well, I wanna ask you, where are your moisture monitors? We know, we have read a lot of scientific reports from geologists that talk about how moisture, rain-sodden bluffs, they are soaking wet. We have bluffs in this area where water is coming through even in the dead of summer, and you know that. Okay, so they are wet, and then you've got these heavy freight trains going by vibrating. Okay, it's like Godzilla walking next to a sand pile. It doesn't work. You, can, you can't keep doing that. So I wanna ask you, do you have vibration monitors? Have you even checked how much vibration is caused by the trains and what impact that might have on rain-soaked bluffs? I honestly think your trains could be a menace. You could be causing the very problems you then expect taxpayers to pay to mitigate. So we need to look at that. And the other thing I would like you to look at is, um, uh, yeah, the vibration and the moisture. I think you should be, should be uh, monitoring to see how wet are they. We have rain coming again this weekend. Last time when you fixed the uh, slide at uh, Casa Romantica, you restarted the trains quickly. And within a week, you had another major slide. I read this morning to my horror that the hillside at Mariposa is still moving. <laughs> it's still moving and you're putting passengers on that line. Can you explain that? And then the mayor of San Clemente mentioned that they can't put back the... Um, the passenger uh, bridge right away because every time it rains, you get too much water and it's destabilizing of the hillside and you're putting passengers there. I mean, <laughs> there's, you've got to have some interest in public safety. Uh, surely your legal people are weighing in on potential liability. I mean, these are dangerous things. Um, uh, one other thing I'd like to ask is about the funding. So you're talking about spending $200 million on basically on rocks in the next summer. So meanwhile, where we're all listening, you're, you're busily putting your rock down, which means that the listening sessions are, are kind of a sham. You know, why listen to us? We're telling you don't put rock down and you're putting down rock where you're supposed to be listening to us. Um, but that is going to be funded by taxpayers. You know that you say, oh, it's the state, it's the feds. That's my pocket. That's your pocket. Taxpayers have a very important interest in this, and we should get to a say. And as Mandy Sackett said with Surfrider, we absolutely should not be trying to circumvent normal coastal protections. The Coastal Commission is there for a reason. CEQA is there for a reason. This is not an emergency. When you have an emergency that keeps happening over three years, it's now normal. This is your new normal, and you need to go through normal mitigations. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Nelson. Mr. Walsh. Yeah, hi, thank you for having us here. Gary Walsh, Save Our Beaches SC. And uh, I wanna say that Save Our Beaches SC, we're, we're cautiously optimistic you know, that you are doing listening sessions, that you are doing due diligence, it seems. Um, and I, not a, this isn't a set speech because uh, we have to do it kind of on the fly here. So I'm kind of, but I am gonna kind of answer to what Mr. Fu had said and kind of reiterate what uh, Ms. Wilson and Dr. Uh, Berg said over here is that, um, I know he's not a real doctor. <laughs> he only pretends to be one. Um, is that uh, OCTA has actually known about these Dehiri beaches and stuff for over 70 years. Orange County, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers identified this nearly 70 years ago. Uh, and as she reported, uh, even more recently, there was reports. So the question, the big question is, why wasn't OCTA doing something about it then? And the same question applies to after the uh, landslide down at Cypress Shores, is that 
we predicted in front of the board of directors of OCTA, in front of Coastal Commission two years ago, Susie and myself predicted that this would creep northward, that the use of the riprap would cause a deterioration moving right up the beach, right up through San, State, uh, San, uh, San Clemente State Beach. So there was no emergency at that point. So we kept encouraging sand. And that's our mantra, that's our answer, is you need to put sand down. Now, um, also mentioned during the report, kind of slid in there kind of covertly, was the talk of coastal retreat, which is more commonly known as managed retreat. And managed retreat is really the uh, break glass in case of emergency uh, policy and should only be used as a last ditch approach. And But I know that that seems to be on the back mind. It's always kind of inserted, well, we might have to do managed retreat, but but we can do things in between that. It's not inevitable that the, the beaches are gonna be lost. It, the uh, evidence is there and you, you have some smart people with HDR here. You guys can figure out ad adaptation, right? So we can do this. Um, the placing of riprap, as we've mentioned, is a permanent solution, really. And it's hard to say that this is a temporary solution when it's going to have permanent results. So when you're putting down riprap, you're basically going to kill that beach. And as I'd like to point out to people, there is a rip in the riprap, and rip normally means rest in peace, right, when in terms of death. And that's what will happen to the beaches that adjoin Rip wrap. They will die. Um, the sand solutions are also a short-term solution, but can be a long-term solution if implemented correctly, if retention systems are put in. So we've been encouraging, put this sand down now. There's no reason to be studying it. Start putting it down now and study what happens after you do it. Do that. You know, take that approach. And that's what we'd like to see. We'd like to see a more aggressive uh, adaptation of that. Because you're exactly right. There will be more threats. But if you take action now, what's the downside to putting sand out? Now, there are downsides to putting riprap down. Um, it does disturb us a little bit that there is no in real indications of sand in your studies, that everything's uh, around riprap. So we'd like to see sand studied and actually used. And we'd like to have the stakeholders, as you call them, actively involved in this process. We have some smart people inside our organizations that have thought through things. We have innovative ideas. Uh, San Clemente, the city of San Clemente shouldn't be just a stakeholder, but should be on the OCTA board of directors. As you are here, down here now, realizing this small little area is taking up a lot of uh, OCTA's attention. And the people who are directly affected by it should be involved in this. And I can only request that these type of things take place. And again, we thank you for at least listening. And I assure you that you haven't heard the last of us. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Um, just to remind those that are online, please raise your hand and we'd be happy to call on you um, throughout the session as well. Ms. Taylor. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Taylor. I'm with the California Native Plant Society. I'm an environmental attorney. I live here in San Clemente and I walk the beach trail many days. Um, I have to say that the the emphasis, as we've heard, the emphasis on coastal arming is not the right approach. Um, we believe that we should be looking at nature-based solutions. We should be putting the emphasis on coastal habitat restoration, things like uh, restoring our native dune habitat along the beaches that provide that natural resiliency that we've taken away with this type of development. Um, also, uh, from a legal standpoint, we absolutely need to go through the permitting process. A coastal development permit uh, should be required for this type of scale of, of project. Um, we should be complying with the Coastal Act, with CEQA, 
with the Endangered Species Act, all of those things, uh, you know, we need to like take a hard look at what the impacts are and look for the best possible solutions with the least negative impacts. And that's going to require going through that process. Uh, this is not something that is eligible for an emergency exemption. We've known for a long time that this is a problem. And uh, I think we need to really make a commitment now to do the long-term relocate this rail line by 2035. Uh, as Mandy Sackett mentioned earlier, Del Mar has already done that. I think it's time for us to follow suit and make a concerted effort in this low span corridor to get these trails off this um, very critical coastal line. Uh, we need to move it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. So if you would be so um, kind to help me facilitate um, those in the audience, if you could just go one by one, row by row, I think that's probably the most efficient way. And if we, if you don't mind, if you're able to, if you're comfortable, if you could stand and say your name and um, affiliation, that would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for being here. My name is Andy Holm, City Manager for the City of San Clemente. So I really appreciate you guys being here and listening to some of our concerns. I did appreciate one of your slides earlier where you talked about how the landslides seem to be increasing in their frequency as compared to historically. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. And it's and it's not that they haven't happened in the past. We have had landslides, they're just happening more often. And I think part of the reason for that is, is I think that you know that many of our ancient landslides actually go underneath the tracks and down into the water. They actually exceed where the water is. And so one of the things that's happened is with the, the sand when it's been removed from our beach and that, that weight that has been the, the buttress for keeping those up there is removed and now we're having more landslides. So I do think that the removal of sand from the beach is contributing to some of these landslides that are happening. So, so again, I think it's really important that we are talking about sand. You know, I think that there's a feeling that the revetment is something that's a little bit more permanent than sand. So an investment in a revetment might last longer or something. Um, I know that with sand, there's going to be a constant need to maintain that sand and a constant need to replenish that sand. And that's that's any infrastructure. Doesn't matter whether that's a road, doesn't matter whether that's a home, doesn't matter what it is, constant maintenance is required. And I would argue that that's also required on the revetment. You've had to continue to build this revetment. So the idea that the revetment is the answer because it's a one time, that's not true. The revetment continues to have to be maintained just like the sand would need to be continued to be maintained. So one of the things we would say is that sand, placing sand on the beach would, would accommodate and, and I think address several concerns, including some of the landslides. And then also the, the cost of doing that, I think would be comparable if not less than building up the revetment. And I think you would have a willing partner. I think that the city council and the residents of San Clemente have indicated every indication that the biggest thing that facing this community is to rebuild our beaches, put sand on our beaches. You would have a very willing partner in trying to rebuild the beaches, which again would protect the revetment. And instead of having what is right now kind of an adversarial relationship with the community, the very community that's causing all this problem. So it seems like to me working together, we uh, that willing partnership I think would really be important. So one of the things that's always important is when you are using armoring, and I think we have, well, I think there's there's way more than ample science to indicate that armoring will increase scouring. Um, and so where we have that armoring, we, we understand that that sand will naturally move to where it's not level. We understand the need for a revetment for a railroad. That railroad has to be level. We understand that there is some armoring necessary for a railroad, and I, I think we can all agree. But wherever that armoring is required, there should be some thought of how, how we protect that with the sand, keep the water away from that. Um, even with your new revetment that was put in this last year during king tides, the water's still going over your tracks, even with the new revetment. So we've got to, we've got to push that water back to the seaward side or there's gonna constantly be problems with the tracks. So again, there was a lot of mention with, with what's happening in Sandag. Um, I had an opportunity for the last decade to work with Dr. Serge Dedina, who was the chair of the Sandag Shoreline Protection for many years. And, and, and if I didn't learn anything else, the one thing I learned is the only solution is sand. The only solution to shoreline preservation and protection is sand. Everything else um, has, has and, and what's that's what was naturally there. That's what protected it along. And as we've tried these new things, whether they are revetments or seawalls or, or, or other features, the sand has gone away. 
So I, I hope we all get back on, on really focusing on, on trying to bring sand back to our beaches. Again, you'd have a very willing partner in the city of San Clemente in trying to, to protect your resources with sand uh, rather than maybe the adversarial uh, concerns that we might have with, uh, with an additional or event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, thank you. We'll go down the line. Uh, Victor Cabral, the mayor of San Clemente. I just wanted to thank you for being here. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to a partnership with you. Uh, I don't think we have that quite yet established, but we're looking forward to it. Last week, we met with, went and met with the leadership of, of the organization, and I reached out to some of the board members on the committee so that we can have a better relationship. Uh, communication is, is key to that, uh, and we're looking forward to that. One of the things well, I will say that when I look at OCTA and 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 uh, and the name, even in in itself, it's it's about transportation, and in this case, it's about rails. And I know you do an extraordinary job of protecting that infrastructure, but here we're talking about more than just protecting the infrastructure. We have to also protect our community and our beaches, and that's a, that's an element I think that this city has done well for, for for years we we've spent um, i guess 40 years ago we started with the sam replenishment uh, project with the army corps of engineers uh, their expertise our expertise we've done several studies over the past several years we have all our experts here in the community we 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 can add to and contribute to this project significantly by showing you what we've done in order to protect our beaches which we also think serves the dual purpose of protecting the tracks, which is your primary objective, as I understand it. But there's a multiple aspect, protecting the bluffs, protecting the tracks and protecting the beach, making this a great community is what we're after. And we're, we're, look, we're a willing partner to, to help in that effort. We hope that we can communicate a little bit better in the future and work towards a solution that's uh, of our, in our mutual interest. So thank you for being here and starting this process. Hello, my name is Christopher Butler. I'm the president of the North Beach Community Association. Thank you for being here. You know, this is a tough conversation, but it needs to happen. Um, just wanted to talk about first, I just noticed on your existing condition slide, uh, location one, all your other locations show the beach, but Location one didn't, and uh, it's unfortunate because it also would have showed the kids playing on the beach there. Um, to the point of Surfrider and the other experts here, I just want to point out that uh, we definitely don't want this to go through emergency permit to protect all the affected parties and understand the real full effects of the beaches and communities that any solution would have to the uh, beach and the community. The full per permitting process should be followed for any proposed short term or long term solution. There must be an independent third party computer model showing the effects to the beach, sand, ecosystem, surf, plants, and animals, not just the rail tracks, as well as an accompanying report evaluating how this would affect the local community socially, financially, and the impact on local amenities. Whoever's uh, going to award that permit needs to have that information as well. That's one thing I've seen in the previous reports is we really don't show the impacts to everybody else. We just show how this is going to affect the railroad. And like Andy said, if any more riprap comes in place, it needs to come with sand. It has to come with sand, and that should be part of your evaluation, I believe, anytime you, you propose that solution. Uh, and the last is a question. Uh, you say this is a two-year study, but based on what I've seen floated out there already, my question is, it seems like you already have plans to take some immediate actions because you feel like there's an imminent threat to your rail. So... It really, can you answer, is this truly a two-year study or are you planning to make uh, immediate action in the next couple of months on any part of the railway? Dan, do you want to respond to that question? Yes, thank you for your comment. So it is a two-year study and that's what I was referring to earlier when I was talking about the phasing approach, which was another way to look at this is the roof is leaking. What needs to be done to keep the roof from leaking? And yes, on the, on the subject of the sand, the, the technical team is looking into it, so it's not falling on deaf ears as far as looking at sand. And I, I, I apologize to forget who made that comment. If if 
there's going to be riprap. It needs to be in combination with saying we are looking into that and we're seeing trying to see to the extent that it is possible and feasible to implement it in the same time frame. It's not that we're reluctant to, it's really about the implementation time frame. So as an example, the city had worked closely with the um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on a sand project that we all know about uh, near the pier. I think it's 0.2 mile linear distance. That took the better part of two decades. And we understand that's a federalized project. It is complicated when it's federalized, but it's still not going to take months. And that's the, the challenge that we're facing in terms of the implementation time. So that's really what it comes down to. It, it's... SAN is definitely going to be part of the solution. It's really more of can we get it out there if if it is going to be the riprap and the SAN concurrently. So that that's really the million dollar question in terms of making sure. So We understand that. I think the the we've seen the ability to enact emergency permits with sand, but what we need is that information be accompanied with the report. So if you say if we put the riprap with the sand, and we need the sand. There's people that can get that into motion quicker potentially than your organization alone. But to say we can't evaluate that or we won't do that because it takes you know, ten twenty years. We have things in process, so I think that's where that partnership comes into play is having our people sit with your people and really tackle these problems together. So when you do put riprap down, if you have to put it down, it's always with SAN. Uh, yes, my name is Amanda Quintanilla. Uh, I'm a San Clemente resident of over 50 years, and I've fought in San, uh, a lot, lot of issues in our town for decades, and uh, most importantly, the TCA uh, routes that would come through our, San, our, our town. And the OCTA has always been our ally, has always been our friend, and participated in a lot of town hall meetings. And uh, communication has always been paramount, and it's always been there. Um, so I'm really concerned about this adversarial um, concept that has been going on right now. Um, I, I think that that's... Um, it's a failure also on our city council because they did away with a transportation subcommittee and that's, it shouldn't be, that was the fault of the city council members. Another thing is that um, there's no OCTA representative. Uh, we had an OCTA representative before, uh, Lori Donchuk, I think it was Kathy Ward, uh, uh, or maybe uh, another council member. So uh, that's that's our own fault. And we have to take ownership and be accountable for our mistakes for the city council. Um, and, um, but I, I do not support this revetment. I do, I feel that we need sand. Sand replenishment is very uh, essential to our city. Um, I feel that um, the OCTA plan should go through CEQA, the NEPA, and of course the approval of the Coastal Commission. And as a San Clemente resident uh, for decades here, we've had our share of landslides throughout the decades, going back to the 20s, 30s, and so forth. Uh, and and at, our, at our bluffs, which are privately owned, and that's something that does not get out there in the community. It, they, they are privately owned, and that's how only Hanson sold those lots. And some of the, the the lots go almost all the way down to the bottom. So those are privately owned. And if you use the OCG, United States Geological Survey, uh, you could see all the landslide areas where there's ancient fault lights, there's Capistrano land formation, Monterey land formation, uh, especially the landslides that were by the St. Andrews by the sea, or uh, actually um, there's, pro there's other landslides in the 1980s that were uh, by presidential heights. So there we have had our share of landslides. So this isn't just something that just happened. Um, we have an ancient landslide that goes parallel to the I-5 uh, down South San Clemente. We have another lands ancient landslides that go parallel 
to the Avenida Pico, which is right next to St. Andrews by the C San Clemente High School. So we have to take that into consideration. But um, as far as uh, something that um, was said earlier was that boulders uh, killed our beaches. However, our coastal resiliency concepts for our city also included putting boulders and um, cobble at North Beach and Mariposa. Well, fortunately, the public spoke up and like we're doing here, and those con conceptual concepts were delineated, they were removed. So I'm very thankful that this meeting was, you know, here, um, that, but it should have been really advertised a lot more so people could be uh, after work, not at 10 a.m. And that really should have been done. We've had um, a lot of um, town halls where OCTA participated and that was at night. And they were with major stakeholders, with Senator Pat Bates and other representatives. And so I think that we really need to also have Assembly Member uh, Lori Davies or Senator Janet Wynn and uh, um, Supervisor Katrina Foley, Congressman Mike Levin, to also bring in to our um, uh, to the meetings to be uh, participating in that. Um, thank you for the comments. You. I would I would mention that we are having a general public session on um, the actually the residential group session on April third is in the evening, so it's after hours, after work hours, as well as the April eleventh general public virtual meeting that will also be after hours, um, not during the the daytime. And then our elected officials roundtable will be during the day, but it will be with all regional stakeholders that you just mentioned. And then the general public session in person on the 30th will also be after hours and in person. Oh. So there's several options for people, either virtual or in person um, throughout this process. Great, thank you, Christina. Well, also, the lastly, I just wanted to mention the landslide at Casa Romantica, from what my understanding, there was a problem with groundwater in the bluffs and with layers of clay and sand and the water uh, sheath, it basically, uh, sleeve, I'm sorry, it just be, makes made it very slippery. So a lot of people don't understand that our bluffs are constantly having that flow of water. And that is just something that occurs. But uh, thank you so much for your time. I thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, we move on to the next. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dustin Brady. I'm a local business owner here. Um, there's a lot of smart people talking. I don't want to speak about science and all that stuff. I'm just going to speak as a business owner. Didn't plan to be here. I'm missing work right now. I need to get back, but <clears throat> felt compelled. Um, it's pretty simple. Um, my eyes are really bad, but the speaker in the middle, I think Dr. Whitelaw, what she said just, I mean, it's just it's simple. It's understanding, right? Like if you think about construction, you need your foundation to be dry. And, and then I was looking at beautiful pictures of our beach and all the sand, it protected the train tracks forever. And I understand that's your main objective, but us in the city, uh, I can speak as a lifelong resident. Um, I travel all the world for my, my other job, not the one my wife owns, but um, I see San Clemente pop up on magazines in a plane in Japan um, about like interviews of rainbow, like, like there's, we're a tourist destination and, and our tourist destination is our beach. Our beach is our lifeline and that's our identity. And me as a business owner, as uh, a frequently visited place, uh, people come to us because they were laying on the beach, Googling, and then they come to us. Like it's our beach. So sand is a beach. Uh, please, as everyone in this room has said, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing, please put sand on our beach and not ruin it with Rivera. I understand part of it's needed, but that's all. Thank you, sir. Bring it. Uh, hello, my name is Tyler Mosier. I'm with the Office of Supervisor Katrina Foley, and she does oversee San Clemente. Um, just want to let you all know that I'm here. Um, I'm a district representative for San Clemente. I'm a San Clemente resident. I grew up here. And I'm going to be taking everything that people have said and relate it to my office. And Supervisor Foley is all about sand. So I just wanted to pass that along. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Zeng Wu, a resident. I'm also a certified planner living in San Clemente. Uh, I ran for city council. Um, I only know this uh, meeting la late last night, so I feel I'm fortunate to be able to hear. Thank you for offering that opportunity to be listened. Um, the title is about resilience, coastal resiliency and habitat, but um, from what I see, the solution is nothing but sustainable. It's a, a brutal engineering solution, um, insensitive to our natural resources, the aesthetics and the recreation, you know, opportunities of the residents. Uh, it is it, it is counterproductive productive to your long term objective. Uh, I understand we need uh, some emergency measures to stabilize the track to keep it running, but the emergency solution um, should not be permanent. It cannot create an ir irreparable long term damage. I do not hear that you have any plan to remove them. Any emergency measure need, needs either to be reversed or removed or be incorporated into your long-term solution. Um, regarding the money, the city is spending, along with the state and the federal government, is, stand, is spending about $25 million to put a quarter million cubic yards of sand on the beach. Uh, for about a little over half mile, three thousand I think it's a three thousand two hundred feet. It's going to build the beach out for seventy five yard seventy five feet. After it's stabilized, you know, uh, balanced, it will have fifty feet of sand beach, and it needs to be replenished every five years. So, assuming that the the sand beach will recede at about ten feet per year, with this amount of money. 200 million, you can do the same thing to almost four miles of St. Clemente Beach. Almost every segment that you have concern and it's going to last for a minimum of five years uh, while you're working on what you call a short-term solution because the center replacement is the only solution this community will support. It leaves no trace to our beach because it will become part of our beach Anything else, um, such as rip wrap, is going to have long-term negative effect to the beach. We don't think that you should uh, use your emergency power to implement such a project, uh, with the exception maybe if you just dump a sand on the beach, you may be able to qualify for, for that without going through a CEQA process. Uh, City of St. Clemente has historically and traditionally being a good collaborator with OCTA, and I hope that um, cordial relationship to continue. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We have about 15 or so minutes left in the meeting, and I want to make sure anyone that still wants to speak may be able to. So, Maria? Thank you. Um, I'll make this brief. I'm a resident. I'm a, one of seven residents at the condominium 903 Buena Vista. That's where the bluff had failed. Um, we've spent the last four or five years since it first started in 2019 working with the city, trying to figure out what to do. The plans had shifted, changed, depending on whether they're deciding to actually build a new bridge. Then this last failure pretty much put the, the stop on that. I would like to just say maybe even work with the city that they might share with a lot of the homeowners that live on the bluff what they can do to mitigate some of this. We've made our efforts to take the water off the bluff. We got it going to drains, which we understood was going to an abandoned uh, city uh, drain system. Well, I think now we found out when part of the bluff failed and a lot of the ice plant removed, we saw our drain sitting or hanging, dangling on the hillside. So I don't know if it broke or if it's been that way all this time. Here we were thinking it was actually going to the storm drain. So we have plans you know, to possibly, I guess, pump it up to the city drainage, but we're learning. We're just, I've been here 13 years. I didn't even know where our property line was until uh, Mr. Bonica told us it was only like 10 feet up from the, the bridge. So we have neighbors that are asking, what can they do? They don't know where the drains, we've got all these plastic drains that are like running off the hillside. And they don't, is that mine? Is that yours? So Drew, one of the railroad guys, he said, run water down yours. He had a guy with a radio. We ran the water and he said, oh yeah, it's going to the city storm drain. You're good. I thought, that's fantastic. Good. 
well, then we found out a week later, no, that wasn't true at all. Yeah, it was going to the storm drain, but it was just dangling off the hillside. So it would help to work with the homeowner, especially at the bluff like where we are. I read somewhere that Dana Point, I guess, gets like information every year, what they can do, plants, things that they can do to keep the water from running out the hillside. I don't think I've ever gotten that here. So if if it went out, I missed it. So that would be helpful. Anyway. Thank you, sir. Uh oh, I think this is what it is. Oh, here we go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, for helping. All right. Hey, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, as a concerned resident, I'm glad to Could see you that you're- Could you please say your name, sir? Oh, sorry. Ken Pochekai. Um, as a concerned resident, I'm glad to see you're working on a on a longer term plan. Uh, looking back, uh, probably most of us weren't here when the plan should have been developed. So it's it's great that you're taking that opportunity now to put that together. Um, I would warn against skipping processes as you look at that long term plan. I know you've heard that a lot today. And as a resident, we're going to fight that pretty hard. Uh, that is unacceptable. You cannot skip those processes. I have watched the the riprap roll in over the last year and a half, two years, just randomly show up and get dumped on our beaches. And we really didn't even know about it. So that's pretty disturbing. Um, from a resident standpoint, I walk the beach trail a lot. There, the water is coming up. Somebody mentioned it earlier. The water is up to the tracks. The more riprap doesn't solve any problems. I have pictures of it. It's splashing up onto the tracks. So the only thing that solves that is the beach. And the beach has solved your problem for 100 years now. So I hope that you will uh, take the easier approach, work with uh, this community, and get our beaches put back. And guess what? The rail can be a, a future plan that maybe it is moved, maybe it's not. But I think you'll find that. From an approval standpoint, um, Capo Beach got sand approved in a few months. It was like as soon as uh, our county people got involved, bam, they had sand. I was like, my God, I was so jealous. How do they pull that off? Yeah, we, and I love that you did it because it, yep, I love that you did it. And I, I, it just shows that we can do that. We can do that together with you and make that happen. So we'd love to support you on that. We'd love to be a part of the process and uh, we hope that you'll continue. Thank you. Doing that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Again, if you um, are planning to speak, please raise your hand so we can come to you, say your name, and if you're a resident or your affiliation, that'd be very helpful. Hi, I'm Lois McNichol, resident of San Clemente. Been here five years. Came here because of the beach and loved running the trail along the beach until they barricaded the beach. But now I have said, okay, I'll just run the coast highway. However, I have noticed the outcropping of rock piles coming and they were not there. So that's why, again, this listening session, which I have a problem with that, because if this is a listening session, then why are there rock piles of rock already on the beach? What are you doing with those? Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak? Please raise your hands. So we can get to you. And online, if there's anyone that wishes to speak, please raise your hand and I will call on you and we'll unmute your mic. Is there anyone else, Maria? Oh, Tony? And we will be wrapping up within the next five minutes or so. Hi, I just wanted to speak on behalf of Capo Cares and mention that we are incredibly grateful for the sand that showed up on our beach last summer. And uh, that was through the efforts of Supervisor Katrina Foley. And um, it made such a huge difference. Capo Beach has been sort of ground zero. We are the canary in the coal mine. We have lost everything there. And we got back a beach that people are enjoying every weekend and during the week, and it's beautiful. And even with a lot of heavy storms and surf, at least half of that sand is still there. And the good news is it's moving down coast. We're seeing it down on Beach Road. We're seeing it down on Pochi. It's, and, it, and according to Brett Sanders, it will move back and forth within our littoral cell. So we know it can be done and it doesn't take 20 years. Well, Supervisor Foley has already identified that there is tons of sand at the Prado Dam. That's really good, clean sand that comes from a river, just like the sand we got, which came from the riverbed in Santa Ana. It's fantastic sand. 
It's heavy enough that it stays there. It's super clean. There's no dirt in it at all. It's just coming off the mountains and it has little tiny shells in it. It's beautiful natural sand. And the other thing I wanted to mention is I read that um, you're planning to put some kind of screen and some kind of hydro seeding on that hillside in Mariposa. And I highly recommend that you talk to some people like Elizabeth Taylor over here or some of the people who have some uh, knowledge of what to do with planting the bluffs. Ice plant should not be on a bluff. It has absolutely no roots. It should be things like coyote bush and lemonade berry, good natives that have lots of strength and lots of roots to hold them. And I also really encourage both the cities of San Clemente and Dana Point to get on any bluff owners who have drains going off the side. That's crazy. We're told to put our drains to the street where the water can get picked up through the um, sewers. And it's really on the cities and the water authorities to figure that out. There is no need to have water seeping out of our hillsides all the time. And a lot of that is groundwater coming from uh, Orange County, but people suspect their pools leaking. There's golf courses that, you know, there's a big problem with water. Water is the enemy. And I really encourage you to look into that. Thank, Thank you. you, Tony. Susie. Um, I she said most of what I wanted to say, um, but I did want to point out that I, I think in the last week, Mr. Fu said that, that that putting sand on the beach is really controversial and it's difficult because you have to find the right grain size. And I'll, I'll tell you what the wrong grain size is. A four ton boulders are are really the wrong, wrong grain size. Uh, the Santa Ana River has a lot of sand. Prado Dam has probably 50 million tons of sand there. There's plenty of beautiful sand there. Orange County Water District has to get rid of it. You may be able to get it delivered for free. Um, and so if you do that, it, and, and, and by the way, our, our, our San Clemente project didn't take 20 years to develop. It took 20 years to fund. It took about nine months to develop. Uh, and that involved dredging from the ocean. If you're getting from inland, it's much um, simpler because you're working from the dry land. You're not affecting any borrow side out in the ocean. You don't have to get all that ocean oceanic part done. You, you're going to have 100 people helping you. You could have all the public here saying, yes, please let OCTA do this. Please make OCTA do this. You're going to have all these people here are going to be working with you and working together. I think we can find a funding for it. It's going to be cheaper than $200 million. And you're going to end up even with mitigation credits, you know, instead of having to ha have adverse effects, this is going straight into your mitigation bank for other harmful adverse environmental effects that you do. You are making money and earning money, earning the environmental goodwill of everybody. So thank, thank you, you for thank having you, us Susie. here. Thank you so much. Um, I ju just checked online and I don't see anyone with their hand raised. Um, thank you all for attending today. If you didn't have a chance to sign in, please do so. Um, and if you haven't signed up to our database, that's okay. If you sign up um, today, then we'll be sure to add you. Again, thank you, and we'll be sending out more information regarding those uh, meetings we're hosting for the general public. So you'll be sure you'll be able to share information with your constituencies. Thank you, and have a great day.